Okay, this is part two to part one, and I'll try not to do this very often, but it reminds me that when um, I was an, a pastor, and that's been a few years ago, but for 15 years I was a pastor and had the privilege of preaching, and it never failed. After every sermon, I would have this thought, why didn't you say that? Or why didn't you say this? And, um, well, it uh, repeated itself because almost as soon as I was done with the um, uh, last night's uh, message on the Lordship attributes, I thought, why didn't you apply it to the issue of Lordship salvation? It would have been perfect. So let's do that real quick. And um, by quick, I mean that we're not going to do an exhaustive study of, of an issue that has been plaguing the evangelical community for the last 20 years or more. And it's a very serious issue. Um, those of you who are watching this or listening to it, I'm sure you have heard the, the controversy, uh, the Lordship controversy. Um, John MacArthur's at the... Um, center of that along with Zane Hodges and other people and the issue is whether or not a person has to accept Christ as Lord as well as Savior uh, in order to be truly saved and um, I want to and and the issue comes down looked at it from another way is there such thing as a carnal Christian and I'm going to state out up front that the notion of a carnal Christian, depending upon how you define it, but as it's defined in dispensational circles, is a heresy. And um, that's a serious uh, charge. So I want to ask this question. When we talked about the Lordship attributes in our last session, we talked about what it means to say that God is Lord. 7,500 times or over, God is called the Lord, and he wants to be recognized as such. So it, it, thought, it occurred to me that it's the Lord that we are asking to save us and to forgive our sins and we noted in our last segment together that at the very essence of what it means to be Lord is, well, let me back up, the main message of the Old Testament is Yahweh is Lord, the main message of the New Testament is Jesus is Lord. Now, then we asked the question last night, what does it mean to say that God or Jesus is Lord. And we noted that it, um, from three different perspectives, it means that um, his lordship attributes contain um, control or sovereignty and uh, his authority and his presence, Con power, authority, and presence. Those three different perspectives on the lordship. So, if we understand the Lord as the absolute sovereign king of the universe, the one who is uh, also absolutely authoritative and elicits um, from us obligation, and that his presence is with those who are covenantally uh, connected with him by virtue of our union with Christ, how in the world can anyone say that the Lord that they have accepted as their Savior is not their Lord? It's like a monstrous oxymoron or contradiction in terms. Are you following my logic? If the Lord is who the Lord says he is, then he doesn't just come in as Savior. He has to relate to us as he is, and that's the Lord, meaning that he is absolutely sovereign, um, that he is uh, 
absolutely authoritative and his presence is with us. So the issue when we talk to you about a carnal Christian, um, I want to try to deal with this quickly, but also is in a balanced way as possible. And that is, is there's different ways of, uh, we're going to make it clear what we're talking about when we're talking about a carnal Christian. Uh, because every Christian is carnal in one sense, um, carnal having to do with the flesh. And every human being has one nature. A non-Christian has one nature, and a Christian has one nature. Uh, we're new creatures in Christ. However, we have indwelling sin that will remain in us until we are glorified. So in that sense, in Galatians 5, 17, Romans 7, and elsewhere we struggle with indwelling sin. So we, in that sense, we're all carnal. And so again, kind of looking at it from a pastoral perspective, I want to be very careful that I not set up some kind of super spiritual idea of what it means to be saved. Uh, and I have to be honest with myself, the periods where I have struggled severely as well. Um, the car a carnal Christian is would include that we would notions like that um, we're all maturing. Uh, we all have, as I said, the flesh, carnality. Uh, we're all immature to some extent. We all can continue to grow. Um, we all slip into sin. We see David. You know, one of the greatest saints for a year or so slipped into horrible sin, but he came back. And um, so it's uh, it's important, again, that we define this, this carefully. What I am calling a heresy is the notion that we can intentionally ask Christ to be our Savior and, and intentionally not want him to be the leader of our life or to be the Lord of our life and to put that off indefinitely. Um, and if there is no sense, no sense, in which that person is under the Lordship of Christ, then they're not a Christian. It's as simple as that. The book of James is clear about that, is it not? We don't have to look go any further than the book of James. It says in two, chapter 2, verse 14 and following that, Faith without works is dead. Now the reformers like Luther and Calvin were very helpful because, again, they were pastors as well as theologians. And the way that they put it was that, yes, we are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone, or not by a lonely faith. Faith that's real will evidence itself sooner rather than later in some kind of a change to life. Because by definition, a Christian is one who has the Holy Spirit within them. We're going to learn later in uh, this series that regeneration precedes faith. But that's another issue. The, the point being is that, is that by definition, a Christian is one who has a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. So they're a changed person. They have a new identity. A that is a person who's truly saved. So if they are, um, again, if, if a person has uh, truly been born again or been saved or justified, then in the phrase of, Euster, <laughs> of, of um, Luther, they are similarly used to set peccator, which means they're simultaneously justified and sinful. 
and that's that's a good pastoral way to look at it. We'll, we are perfect in God's eyes by virtue of our union with Christ, but in ourselves we still have indwelling sin, and we will until we die and our, our Christ comes back and we're um, we're glorified. And but the 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 um, the uh, idea that I want to challenge is the notion that we can intentionally say that there's no need at all to accept Christ as our Lord in order to be saved. I remember when I was 18 years old and newly saved, and I read a book by James Ryrie, The New Christian Life, um, something like that. Anyway, it's, this is one of the heresies of dispensationalism. You'll find out in the series that I'm not a big fan of dispensationalism. And one of its biggest errors is this um, heretical doctrine of salvation. And I know that the guy like Zane Hodges who wrote the book on um, trying to um, defend um, lordship less salvation. The intent is to try to um, uh, to defend justification by faith alone, but the result is um, tearing Christ apart. You know, him being our Savior and him being our Lord, it's not an optional extra. And saying that Christ, asking Christ to that we're saved by asking Christ to be our Savior and Lord, that's not by works. That's just the definition of what true faith is. Because according to, to the Bible, the true definition of faith is not just a, uh, an intellectual acknowledgement of the facts, because the demons know that, but Again, um, going back to the reformers, and um, they, they had there's three levels of um, of, of faith. There's uh, notitia, which is the knowledge of the facts of the gospel. Um, there is assensus, which is assenting to or recognizing the truth of the gospel intellectually, and then there is fiducia, which is resting upon the gospel and upon Christ as one Savior. And that's where when you talk about faith, true saving faith is fiducia, where we there's the element of personal trust in him. And that's where the works come in. Because you can't we can't say that we're truly trusting in Christ if we're um, not living in if it were for not trusting in him and just living on our own. And um, let me make sure I cover everything before I move on. Um, yeah, if there's no signs of, of a work of grace in a person's life, then there's simply no salvation in that person's life. And it, it grieves me that there are going to be millions of people uh, who have been misled because of this heretical teaching, who are going to wake up in hell because they have been told that if you sign a card, if you make a profession of faith, if you hold up your hand, uh, you know, every uh, people's eyes are, are closed. I mean, it's, it's altogether right to make a profession of faith that's needed. But what saves a person is is not that act is what happens in the heart as to whether or not there is a true um, trusting in Christ as the means by which we are saved and that means accepting not a fictional Christ but the Lord Christ, accepting the Lord as our Savior, 
I guess I could summarize it very simply by saying, going back to our um, talk last night, that it's not just a uh, kind of a, it's not just an amorphous Jesus that we're asking to save us. It is the Lord that we're asking to save us. And it's the Lord who is absolutely sovereign, commands and demands because of his authority, uh, obligating us to obey him and his personal holy presence within us. And it's this Lord that um, we are dealing with in this Lordship salvation. And uh, so I hope that helps. Uh, again, we all, till our dying days, will be carnal in one sense. It all depends on how you define what a carnal Christian is. And, um, you know, the Bible talks about carnal Christians, as I said, in First Corinthians and so forth. But if you, you, if you define a carnal Christian as one in which it's a person who has no sense in which Christ is leading their life, that there has been no change whatsoever in their allegiance, in their heart, then that's a clear sign that there has been no work of grace in their heart. And um, I, I can just look at my own life, knowing that I've gone through periods of, of spiritual decline, and um, folks who deal with addiction and so forth, you know, I don't want them to feel really guilty about the struggles that they go through and, and all that sort of thing, but um, because it's not an either or, it's, it's an addiction and it's a sin, whether it's pornography or pain pills or alcohol or whatever. Um, the issue is whether or not your heart is struggling uh, with that issue and that you want to get over it and you want Christ to uh, forgive you and to um, be the, the, the ruler of your life. And there's a sense in which as we grow in Christ that we'll see more and more our carnality. We gain more victory over the sin in our life, but we'll actually see ourselves as being more and more fleshly. So, I hope that helps. Um, thank you.